In the name of God, and His Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Merry Christmas. I can still say that, because it's still Christmas. Because that festival that begins with the first of Christ's Masses at midnight on December 24th continues until the end of that whole cycle of scripture readings that deal specifically with the, the birth and the infancy of Jesus. Most churches in the West consider the end of that cycle to occur at Epiphany, exactly 12 days later, hence the 12 days of Christmas. The Epiphany is um, uh, representing both the circumcision of Jesus um, and the presentation in the temple, We've kind of conflated those two. Um, but you can also make the argument, and I certainly do when I don't get around to taking the ornaments down, um, that it extends until February 2nd, the Feast of the Presentation itself, um, which long before it was Groundhog Day uh, was the Feast of the Presentation for almost two millennia. Anyway, I hope your Christmas so far has been merry, that you had time with family and friends, that you had a chance to relax, to listen to some good Christmas music, and by good, I mean good. Santa baby doesn't count. Um, I hope you've had a chance to, to have some really good seasonal delicacies, Christmas cookies, or whatever it is your family does. Uh, we've been working away at the Polish specialties a day at a time instead of all at once, which is actually a little bit better. Um, that you've had a chance to sort of smell the evergreen and the pine that are really giving off their fragrances right now that you've had a chance to, to see beautiful decorations, silver, tinsel, glittering on green, and red, and gold ornaments, that you've had a chance to, to be even just a little bit thankful for a little bit of dusting of snow, you know? Not, not, not a lot, not enough to shut the city down, but just enough to look nice on the ground. But I hope in the midst of all of that wonderful kind of holiday stuff that we all look forward to, that you've also had a chance to contemplate, that you've also had a chance to, to really ponder prayerfully with, with that kind of wide-eyed wonder, that profound mystery of the Incarnation. And I hope that, that in the midst of that, and in the midst of, of reading the scriptures, in the midst of, of, of hearing the stories, that it has started to, to somehow affect you, that it started somehow to, to dawn on you what a tremendous, tremendous love story there is behind all of that. And I hope, I hope for all of you that whether you, you, you're, you do it in private and nobody sees you, or whether you're sitting there in full view of the public, that, that somehow it brings a tear to your eye, that you recognize with, with great gratitude how deep the Father's love for us was that he would send his only Son to rescue the likes of you and me. We who were, many of us, probably born in comfortable hospitals and, and, and so on, to be, to be replaced, as it were, by this baby who was born out of wedlock, out of, away from home, manger in a distant city in a cold night with, with nothing but the breath of animals to warm him, became a refugee. All of that for you and me. What a great love story that is. You know, and I hope, I hope that in the midst of that you, you, you follow that love story and you follow it all the way back all the way back to the beginning, to the creation, when the Word was with God and the Word was God. And I hope that that makes you pause, that that makes you stop. That something about that kind of mind-bending statement that the Word was both with God and was God somehow gives you pause. That the one through whom and for whom all things were made and without whom was not anything made that was made that the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Prince of Peace, the Light, chose voluntarily, willingly, constrained by nothing but love for his Father and for us, 
to come and, as the Greek text says, pitch his tent among us. We might say colloquially, he moved in next door. And yet I'm flabbergasted by how many people think of this as just kind of a ho-hum sort of statement. The word became flesh, dwelt among us. Now I will grant you that if you look at this first chapter of the Gospel of John, called the prologue, everything else that happens in the Gospel according to John really reflects back onto this first, this first chapter. But I will grant you that this first chapter of John is, is very poetic, it's very profound, it's very deep, and there's not a whole lot you can actually do with it right out of the box. Right? It's, it's not the kind of self-evidently useful news you can take home and use as soon as you get home from church today. Right? It's, not, it's not the kind of scripture passage that's going to teach you how to live. It's not going to get you into college or get you a job or get you a raise or get you a better job. It's not going to improve your golf game. It's not going to improve your love life. You can't use this passage to win friends and influence people. It's not a cure for cancer. It's not a blueprint for living the good life. It's not a policy platform for a just society. It doesn't tell us how to end hunger or oppression or illiteracy or homelessness or war. It doesn't teach you how to balance your checkbook, let alone the national budget. It probably won't even go very far to comfort a grieving soul or to encourage someone who's disheartened or, or to help somebody make sense out of why their world and their life has just fallen apart. But it is a passage with a purpose. It does have a use. And that use is precisely to cause us to fall in love, head over heels in love, with this God who is both one and three, with the Word made flesh next door, who is also the light of men, the light of the human race, the light of the world, the truth, the way. The purpose of this prologue to John is to, is to give us a reason to fall in love again with the beauty of holiness, with the goodness and righteousness of God and of his word. I mean, this, this is the same theme that Father Ed mentioned in his Christmas Eve sermon, this idea of, of falling head over heels in love. And maybe that's why the Holy Spirit, who is wiser than all of us, has guided the church to keep shoving this particular passage in front of us time and time again throughout the Christmas season. It's read at least four times, five or six, depending on which services you, you choose. It keeps coming up, these same 14 or 18 verses from the first chapter of John. It's not because they're that hard to understand. It's not because we have to scratch our heads and puzzle over them. In their own way, they are just, just as vivid as the stories of the angels and the shepherds and the wise men. And in some ways, maybe even somewhat more satisfying, more tangible, more present to us here today, and certainly more enduring than, than the other stuff that we trot out of the Christmas season, and more transformative. Right? Don't, don't spend your time contemplating this passage trying to figure out what it means. But let the, let the passage, let the words wash over you. Ease into that, that revelation that the word was not only with God, but was God. Stop struggling against the mystery. And instead, just allow it to, to permeate your consciousness. Don't try to wrap your head around it. Let it reshape your thoughts, your mind. Paul would eventually get around to writing and saying, be, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Let the word of God enter into you and change you. And maybe if you do this, maybe for the first time even, you might, you might finally get a, a sense that this is what you've wanted for Christmas all along. A God who is big enough. A God who is large enough to stand outside of creation, who isn't affected by us. A God that, that cannot be manipulated. A God who 
cannot be exploited. A God who is simply, purely, goodly, lovingly, justly, mercifully there. Perfectly just, merciful to the point of self, self-immolation, even for the likes of you and me. A God who has a design and a plan for us, a plan for our perfect joy, our perfect fulfillment, and a God who knows way better than we do just what will do that for us. A God who, who cares about us, not in the big picture way, alone, but deeply and minutely, not just about the ideas in our heads, not just about the dispositions of our hearts, or the works of our hands, but who counts every single hair on our heads, who cares about our emotions, our feelings, our triumphs, our failures, our biographies, our relationships, our past, our present, and our future. Sink into that. That's the love story. That's what it means that the Word has always been there, that the Word created everything, that the Word created even us, and has loved us since the beginning, and continues to love us even now. And the deeper we can sink into that love story, the deeper we can we can go into that prologue to John, the greater our wonder at that, the greater the sense of, of unworthiness that it evokes in us, the recognition that this is truly an undeserved gift, the greater the praise that it arouses in us, and the better the better we are being conformed to that one, that Christ who came, who came that we might have life and have it in abundant fullness, into whose, into whose image and likeness we are to grow, to attain to the full maturity, full stature of Christ. That was God's plan for us from the beginning. And this is, this is the beginning of its definitive fulfillment. But it will only happen if we actually do spend time with the Word, if we actually do spend time with the Word made flesh, if we actually do spend time pondering and contemplating the words of Scripture, looking at the ways in which we, we present Christ to one another here in this church, through, through our crush scene, through the Eucharist, through our own presence here, through our fellowship with one another, the gracious words we speak, the forbearance that we show to one another. And since the word become flesh has moved in next door, you know, the least that you and I could do would be to stick around him and visit, invite him over, or better still, go knock on his door. They will open, I promise. Get to know him, get to know the Father. Talk with them. Don't worry about communication. The Holy Spirit will give you the words to say. Dine with them. They throw one heck of a dinner party. The bread and the wine are particularly good. And I recommend this to you not just as an optional luxury, not just as something that's attractive primarily to people who like religious kinds of stuff, but as a crucial necessity if we are going to grow and especially if we're going to, to really know the kind of exaltation, the kind of rejoicing that we heard in Isaiah this morning. And most importantly, we need to immerse ourselves in the Word if we are going to avoid the traps, the snares, the deceits of the devil, of the evil one. Because make no mistake about it, just because it's Christmas does not mean the devil is not hard at work. That there isn't you know, not just darkness and evil in the world, but a sentient evil, a hungry, predatory evil. Not just the, the damaged, imperfect creation left behind after that, that one really awful snafu in the garden long, long ago, but an evil that actually actively and deliberately hates. An evil that hates the truth and that revels in lies partial truths and oversimplification 
you know, oversimplifications and exaggerations, and evil that hates beauty and actively seeks to, per to pervert and to pollute and to defile the things that God has created and called good. And evil that hates unity, and evil that hates forbearance, that actively promotes impatience and arrogance and condemnation and separation and isolation and anger and animosity. An evil that hates the light that was coming into the world, even if it knows that it cannot ultimately swallow that light and overcome it. And if this seems a little bit too dark a theme for the 12 days of Christmas, just look back at the church calendar and you'll see that December 26th, the very day after Christmas, is the day when we remember St. Stephen, one of the initial seven deacons of the church and, the, and its first martyr who was stoned to death for believing in Jesus Christ. Two days after that, Friday, the 28th of December, we commemorate the Holy Innocents, the Hebrew children, males, two years old and younger, whom Herod sent his soldiers out to slaughter, to wipe them out in the hopes of getting rid of Jesus. And you and I know that there are still places in the world where it is against the law, in fact, punishable by death, to become a Christian. And we don't have to look much farther than Newtown, Connecticut, to know that innocents are still being slaughtered day in and day, and day out. This is not just a pious exercise. We need to do this. And we need to do this because we, you and I, for as much as, as we went to the trouble to come here this morning and to sit in church, as much as we might say our prayers day in and day out, as much as we might, in fact, read the Bible and study, we are always closer to the brink of temptation to join the evil, to join the darkness, than we would care to admit. And that's not because we're going to suddenly and unexpectedly wake up some morning and start plotting mass murders but because we all have areas of our lives in which we just simply limp along in a gray twilight. Most of us, most of us in some area of our lives will let our light shine, but frequently we shy away from letting his light shine. And unless we get to know him well, unless we get to trust him well, unless we become intimate with him and allow him to become intimate with us, even if he moves in next door, we're unlikely to recognize him or receive him, even though we are his own. It's a severe message, but not one without hope, because the light does ultimately triumph. The light is always on next door, and where the light goes, even darkness is not dark. That's especially true for those who are poor in spirit, who've already known enough darkness, and who no longer care to use it as a convenient place to hide their vulnerabilities from the world. These are the people who, who know hunger and thirst in body and soul, people who are lonely or afraid, people who mourn an irretrievable loss, people who are too weak or too meek to stand up for themselves, who are persecuted not for their crimes, but for the righteousness of their lives, they are blessed because they're desperate enough to depend on his mercy and humble enough to accept his justice. And for that reason, God is able to bring out of their lives undeserved good, even from their suffering. Because they have been, by grace, by the action of the Holy Spirit, detached from their cravings for security or creature comforts or self-satisfaction or, or prestige or power because they've tried those things and they didn't work and they've given up on them and they are quite content for his sake to boast to the world only of the things that show their weakness so that the surpassing victorious power of God can be known. That's why I beg you, immerse yourself in the word. Enter into that intimacy with him, that he may purify you as well, and cleanse you and me.
polish us and set us on fire. Brothers and sisters, when we go away from here this morning, fed by the word and, and, and with the word become flesh, I beg of you, don't go out into the world intent on blending back in to the darkness. It's, it's one of the evil one's lies that somehow we must be careful not to differentiate ourselves too much lest we appear threatening. But rather for the sake of Stephen, for the sake of the holy innocence, for the sake of the light of the world, Jesus Christ, go forth to, as bearers of his light. Go forth rejoicing and exulting in the God who has clothed you in bright garments of salvation the robes of righteousness, who has adorned you with a priestly call and bedecked you with jewels to demonstrate his love for you so that others may see and desire to be loved that way as well. And for your sake, I will not be silent. And for your sake, I will not be quiet until your righteousness goes forth as brightness and your salvation as a burning torch. The nations will see your righteousness and the kings your glory, and you shall be called by a new name that the mouth of the Lord will give. You shall be a crown of beauty in the hand of the Lord and a royal diadem 